good evening, everyone. Um, I don't know if you can tell, but I have a giant smile on my face um, because I'm just so happy to, that you're all here and to see all of you, hi, um, and for us to be here together. Um, I'm Martha Lucy, um, Deputy Director for Research um, and Education here at the Barnes. Welcome. Um, I'm going to be really quick because we have a couple of people that are going to be giving, you know, remarks before um, before our talk. Um, we love the Graduate Student Symposium. It is our, our favorite time of year. <laughs> um, I want to thank all the students for, for being here. I want to thank um, advisors and faculty. I want to thank other people in the audience, people who are at home watching. I would like to thank our speaker, uh, Byron Hammond, in advance. Thank you very much. Um, and our co-organizing institutions, especially this year, um, the University of Pennsylvania, and especially David Kim. Of course, I need to thank Aaliyah Palumbo, and I'll be doing this a lot tomorrow. She is our amazing um, manager for and academic programs, and she just, she does everything. Um, she has worked really hard on this whole event. Um, David will be introducing Byron in a minute. Um, but before he does, we are going to hear from uh, one of his colleagues at Penn. Uh, Sarah Garin is Assistant Professor of Medieval Art in the History of Art Department at Penn. Her research focuses on the socioeconomic circumstances surrounding production and use of medieval art, as well as the symbolic potential of materials. She has a book coming out this summer, congratulations, called <laughs> French Gothic Ivories, Material Theologies and the Sculptor's Craft. And tonight she is going to speak um, to us briefly about the department's efforts um, in making space for indigenous vibrancy within the arts community at Penn. So welcome and enjoy. Thank you, Martha, and thank you, David and Alia, for inviting me to say a couple of words about our project. Philadelphia, the University of Pennsylvania, and the Barnes Foundation, in which we are all gathered in person and virtually, all stand on the traditional lands of the Lene Lenape, a name which the Lenape translate as meaning something akin to original peoples. The Lenape who lived in and around what is now Philadelphia spoke the Southern Unami dialect. While William Penn and the first Quaker settlers might have conducted good faith relations with the Lenape, this much vaunted moment of brotherly love was sadly short-lived. The so-called walking purchase of 1737 was a fraudulent transaction whereby James Logan and the sons of William Penn tricked the Lenape leaders, including Manawahican and Weshani Kanikan, into signing away their land. The Lenape leaders immediately protested the subterfuge in writing, and the Lenape never ceded these lands in a good faith transaction. Forceful removals in the wake of the walking purchase and throughout subsequent colonial expansion resulted in the wide diaspora of Lenape or Delaware Indians today, including, but very much not limited to, state-recognized communities in Delaware, New Jersey, Oklahoma, Kansas, and Wisconsin, as well as three First Nations in Ontario. But Philadelphia and Pennsylvania are still home to many families and communities of Indigenous descent from across Turtle Island, including Lenape communities. It is to be noted that despite considerable political and social organization, the state of Pennsylvania does not recognize members of the Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania, nor any other Indigenous people. So I recount this history, still too little known among our community at the University of Pennsylvania in any case, in the spirit of education and respect. It is also an acknowledgement that the appropriation of land and cultural genocide enacted by the colonial past 
is embedded in our living institutions today. But beyond education, acknowledgement, and an acceptance of personal implication in past injustices, it is beholden upon settler communities to conceive of ways in which we can decolonize our institutions from within. In particular, by urgently making space in our institutions for Indigenous histories, Indigenous cultures, Indigenous voices, Indigenous vibrancy, and Indigenous futures. So to this end, a first step towards creating such spaces in the life of the History of Art Department has been a collaboration with a student and fa faculty group, Natives at Penn, led by Toys Holmes, with the Native Arts Organization, We Are the Seeds of Culture, led by Taylin Agoyo, and in dialogue with the leaders of the Native and Indigenous Studies program at Penn to organize a lecture series on Indigenous arts and focus. Generally funded by the Sachs Program for Arts Innovation, this series seeks to bring Indigenous artists, curators, and art historians to campus to reflect upon the rich history and contemporary challenges facing a range of practitioners in the visual and performing arts. Begun in fall 2021, it will continue until December 2022. For our community, this is a first small step towards what we conceive of as a living land acknowledgement. Not scripted words, but education as a first step. Second, long-lasting connections with communities on campus and in Philadelphia. And lastly, making, a, making concrete changes to our programming and priorities. And I would like to note that Lucy Fowler, Willi excuse me, Lucy Fowler Williams is teaching um, a seminar this term in the department um, that is uh, in connection with the wonderful show that just opened here at the Barnes on water, wind, and air. Um, and so that's a, a concrete step. So again, I thank David, Alia, and the whole organizing committee of the Barnes Graduate Symposium for inviting, inviting me as a representative of the Living Land Acknowledgement Working Group that comprises both faculty and graduate students to share with you a bit of our journey and our hopes for the future. So thank you. And David Kim will uh, um, introduce this speaker. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks very much, Sarah, for that description of the department's uh, initiatives. Um, and before introducing our keynote speaker this evening, I'd like to thank our colleagues at the Barnes, um, especially Alia uh, Palumbo for organizing this event. And I'd like to also to recognize our partnerships uh, with Temple and Bryn Mawr, uh, which enable the realization of this very special um, symposium that celebrates uh, the work of um, our graduate students or these graduate students and the many, many hours that the advisors have spent in office hours. I can't imagine, the, we should have count the number of office hours in this room. Um, and welcome to all of you physically with us or in, virtuals, or in the virtual sphere. Um, so I'd like to begin my introduction of our speaker tonight, Byron Hammond, uh, currently a member at the School of Historical Studies at the IAS. Um, by invoking what might be a surprising source, namely the neo-Victorian crime thriller Fingersmith by Sarah Waters. Now, a Fingersmith, a Fingersmith, a sensational tale of Victorian era, underground life, mistaken identities, same-sex love, and period pornography, one reviewer wrote the following. This novel contains so many fiendish, evil, and wicked twists that ambushed readers flip backwards and forwards as they read, trying to locate terra firma. And the same could be said for much of Byron Hammond's work, which also asked the reader to find firm ground and in so doing reconfigures geographies and the roots between them. So yes, Byron Hammond's work's uh, writing focuses on the Americas and Europe and what he calls the early modern Mediterranean and Mediterranean Atlantic world. And yes, as Frederick Cooper and Bruno Latour would might appreciate, his writing adamantly avoids vague discussions of early modern globalizations, offering instead specific connections and roots across land and sea, reconstructed at the level of the document or the material, material trace. 
But to my mind, uh, Hammond's uh, writing raises two fundamental questions that extend beyond a specific art historical field. The first question might be, what is the mode of writing appropriate to historical inquiry? And the second question might be, what is the mode of writing appropriate to dramatic narrative? In his three monographs and many journal articles, essays, and digital, digital media projects, Hammond demonstrates how the archive and the archival instance can serve as a plot twist. That is to say, a radical narrative turn by means of which the reader and spectator experience a combination of reversal and discovery. For example, in his first book, The Translations of Nebriha, a language, culture, and circulation in the early modern world from 2015, Hammond tracks how this tracks how the structure of a Spanish Latin dictionary, first published in 1495, unexpectedly provides the word list framework for non-Latin dictionaries on a global scale uh, for languages spoken in the Americas um, and Asia. In his second book, Bad Christians, New Spains, Muslims, Catholics, and Native Americans in a Mediterranean Atlantic World from 2020, each chapter confronts two inquisitorial investigations, one from Valencia about Muslims and old Christians, and the other from Oaxaca about Native Americans and Europeans. This dialogue between inquisitorial reports reveals a long distance, the remarkably common and shared concerns about the nature of time and cultural techniques that affect social change. His recent article, Field Notes from Solaris, in the journal Grey Room, where he also serves as an editor, mobilizes sources ranging from ship logs to shipwreck archaeology to reveal salt water as an unexpected and surprising protagonist in early modern infrastructure. The archival instance and the, in, the, arch, the archival instance and the insertion of the archive as plot twist can also be said to be confronted head-on in his book, uh, now in press, The Invention of Colonial America, uh, Data, Architecture, and the Archive of the Indies, 1781 to 1844. In this work, uh, forthcoming from uh, the Getty, uh, building layouts and systems of storage are analyzed to set the stage, as it were, for the unforeseen disclosure of how the fabled archive of the Indies imagined the Americas separate and separable from the old world. And in his talk tonight, the archive as plot twist promises to reconfigure our understanding about uncanny resemblances between two early modern cities and ruins, Tenochtitlan and Rome. So please join me in welcoming Byron Hammond. Thank you, David, for that in lovely introduction. Um, and indeed, if any of you have not read Fingersmith, I urge you to do so as soon as possible. I was under the impression I could take off my mask, but maybe that's forbidden. Is this forbidden? It's not forbidden. All right, thank you. I'll drink a lot of water, so that's much appreciated. Oh. So, good evening, and thank you all for coming. It's a great honor to give this Philadelphia Symposium lecture. I'm going to be speaking at a, about a project I've been working on for the past couple of years, and it's very much a work in progress, so I look forward to any comments and suggestions. And my goal is to give you a panoramic overview of the project as a whole, as well as a series of microhistorical moments in its story. And as you'll see, my talk tonight happens to coincide with the start of a series of often tragic 500-year anniversaries. The first was August of last year, 50, uh, 2021, which marked the 500th anniversary of the so-called conquest of Mexico City in 1521. Further 500-year anniversaries loom on the horizon in May 2027 and April 2029. So, to begin. Around 1560, a Native American author in central Mexico wrote an epic poem in Nahuatl about a transatlantic journey to Rome. 
He transformed the Pope into a Mesoamerican noble, hunting butterfly souls in the halls of the Vatican with a turquoise mosaic blowgun. Friends, willow men, behold the Pope who's representing God, who speaks for him. The Pope is on God's mat and seat and speaks for him. Who is this reclining on a golden chair? Look, it's the Pope. He has his turquoise blowgun and he's shooting in the world. It seems it's true. It's, it seems he has his cross and golden staff and these are shining in the world. I grieve in Rome and see his flesh and he's St. Peter, St. Paul. It seems that from the four directions they've been captured, you've made them enter the golden refuge and it's shining. It seems the Pope's home lies painted in golden butterflies. It's beaming. Now, this poem is filled with references to Mesoamerican cosmology. The phrase mat and seat was a Nahuatl metaphor for rulership, uh, Nahuatl being the dominant language in central Mexico, the language of the Aztecs, as well as of their enemies, the Tlaxcalans. Dividing the world into four directions was a common Mesoamerican cosmological model. Is this on? No, all right. And the idea of butterflies as souls went back at least a thousand years in central Mexico to classic period Teotihuacan. So this was a vision of Rome very much from a Mesoamerican point of view, a point to which we'll return. Now, John Beerhorst, the English translator of this and the other poems collected in a Nahua language manuscript known since the 19th century as the Cantares Mexicanos, argued that this poetic journey to Rome was inspired by actual events. In the spring of 1529, a small group of Central Mexican ambassadors, four probably, actually did travel to Rome with a conquistador chaperone, Juan de Rada. And we know the names of two of the Central Mexican travelers. Hernando de Tapia was from Mexico City to Nochitlan, and Benito de Rada Mazatlalqueni was probably from Tlaxcala, one valley to the east of Mexico City. Now, direct references to the 1529 Nahua visit to Rome were known from three key 16th century sources. Two brief mentions in a set of uh, late 1520s economic records, now in Seville's Archive of the Indies, two sentences in Venetian, in, in, sorry, in Vatican quarter, courtier Paolo Giovio's 1551, Praise of Men Illustrious for Courage in War, and two paragraphs in Bernal Diaz del Castillo's True History of the Conquest of New Spain. None of these sources was actually written in 1520s Rome, and so when I started this project, I set out to see if I could locate documents about this trip in Italian archives, and I've had a bit of luck with this, which I'll be talking about shortly. But mid-April 1529 was a very strange time for this small group of Central Mexicans to visit Rome. The Pope, Clement VII, had only just moved back to Rome six months before, in early October 1528. And the reason he'd been living outside of Rome for over a year was because just under two years before the Central Mexicans arrived, in other words, on May 6th, 1527, the city of Rome was invaded by imperial troops loyal to Emperor Charles V of Spain, who at that point, for, com for complicated reasons, was hostile to the papacy. The city of Rome was actively sacked and looted for a week and a half, followed by a year of occupation by those soldiers to February 1528. Now, not even the halls of the Vatican were spared from this violence. Many of Charles V's soldiers, of course, came from the Germanys, which at this point, many parts of which were 10 years into the Reformation. And my opening image shows a defacement of Raphael's School of Athens fresco, iconoclasm probably caused by a long spear, which was the, choice of, was, was the weapon of choice for Charles V's soldiers. They were called lance knights. And across, the very, and across the same room, in the Disputa fresco, soldiers carved the plaster with the words Luther and Charles V Emperor. But of course, Rome was not the only holy city imagined as the center of sacred empire to be sacked and looted by soldiers loyal to Charles V in the 1520s. Less than a decade before the 1529 visit of central Mexicans to Rome, so in 1521, the holy city of Tenochtitlan, capital of the Aztec Empire, had itself been invaded, looted, and reduced to rubble by the combined forces of Hernán Cortés and his indigenous allies. In other words, telling the story of the visit of Central Mexicans to Rome in 1529 requires us to tell a connected transatlantic or indeed Mediterranean story. What was it like for participants in and witnesses to the destruction of Tenochtitlan to find themselves less than a decade later in the ruins of another sacred city. I'm gonna tell this story in four sections. 
Uh, in the first, 1521, 1527, I'll talk about the horrific but unsurprising parallels between what took place in Rome, in Tenochtitlan in 1521 and in Rome in 1527. In part two, Into the East, I'll sketch how from February 1528 to March 1529, a group of about 40 central Mexican nobles traveled across the Atlantic and throughout Iberia with Hernan Cortez, who also brought his own entourage of indigenous entertainers, probably his slaves. These included a team of 12 ball players and eight or nine log acrobats. Oh, into these. This brings us to part three. I'm sorry, in March 1529, the group splits up, at which point four of the central Mexicans traveled on to Rome. And this brings us to part three at the Butterfly House with story of their trip to Rome. And then finally, part four, going home, will tell how at least two of the Roman visitors returned to Iberia. One then rejoined his fellow travelers in, travelers in Seville and then went back across the Atlantic, Atlantic in late August 1529, carrying four papal bulls in support of indigenous churches in specific towns in central Mexico, which is where we will end. Before we start part one, I just want to mention two conceptual reference points for me. The first is the cinematic movement of post-World War II Italian neorealism, and in particular the trilogy that launched neorealism as a genre, Roberto Rossellini's War Trilogy. So Rome, Open City, 1945, Paisat, 1946, and Germany, Year Zero, 1948. These are three extraordinary, if very disturbing films, and if you haven't seen them, the spoiler is no happy endings. In all three, Rossellini used the bombed post-war urban landscapes of Italy or Germany as the non-fictional background for telling fictional but not fantastical stories about ordinary men and women and children caught up in the horrors of war and its after effects. So Rome Open City is set in 1943 when Rome was occupied by the Nazis. Paisa consists of a series of six separate vignettes set 1943 to 1944, moving up the peninsula from Sicily to Naples to Rome to Florence to near Venice. So for example, the Naples vignette involves a black American GI and a thief orphan. The Florence vignette includes a harrowing sequence across the Arno via the Vasari corridor and through the empty halls of the evac evacuated Uffizi gallery. And finally, Germany Year Zero is set in the ruins of post-war Berlin. So my project here involves similar challenges. Although we have various episodic references to the travels of the central Mexicans throughout Iberia and in Rome specifically, I haven't found any first-person accounts by those central Mexican travelers. And even if they did write anything, they would have written in Spanish or in Latin, since their native language, Nahuatl, wasn't written alphabetically until the 1540s. So my project is partially about creating a non-fiction background using European sources, and then against that background, punctuated with micro-historical episodic references to the Central Mexicans, imagining a more complete narrative history. Hence, thinking of this project as a Renaissance neorealist non-fiction. If Rossellini is one key reference point, uh, the other is French historian Fernand Brodel, author of the famed Mediterranean and the Mediterranean world in the age of Philip II, as well as the trilogy of capitalism and civilization. Now, Brodel famously was not only interested in the foam of historical events, things like battles, coronations, weddings, but also in the deeper structures of society and nature in which those events unfolded. Hence, in my talk tonight, you'll be hearing about Iberian road networks, early modern travel speeds by land and sea, as well as the seasonality of spring vegetables and the timing of Renaissance meals. Part one, 1521, 1527, and the water break. So in this section of the project, I'm gonna juxtapose accounts of the conquest of Tenochtitlan in 1521 with those of the sack of Rome in 1527 to underscore how both cities suffered disturbingly parallel horrors of warfare and occupation. And I'll talk about a series of basic atrocities that took place in both cities and illustrate each with two pairs of quotations, uh, two from Tenochtitlan and two from Rome. Now, I'm not going to read all of these, in part because many of them are so gruesome and disturbing. So tonight, as a sample, I'll focus on questions of iconoclasm. Uh, but basically, the shared themes I'm going to compare involve the intentional burning of buildings, the massacre of civilians, streets and buildings filled with the unburied dead, enslavement of war captives, famine, thief and looting, theft and looting, the ripping apart of sacred artworks for their precious metals, and grave robbing. So, for an example on ripping apart sacred artworks, a quote from Tenochtitlan. 
And when the Spaniards were well settled, right away they interrogated Moctezuma about all the stored treasure of the city, the devices and shields. They greatly prodded him. They eagerly sought gold as a thing of esteem. And when they reached the storehouse, the place called Teocalco, then all the shining things were brought out. The Quetzal feather head fan, the devices, the shields, the golden discs, the necklaces of the gods, the golden nose crescents, the golden leg bands, the golden armbands, the golden sheets for the forehead. Thereupon the gold on the shields and on all of the devices was taken off. And when all the gold had, gold had been attached, right away they set on fire, set fire to, ignited all the different precious things. They all burned. And the Spaniards made the gold into bricks. And here are two parallel quotes from Rome. All the vestments and chalices were taken away. The silver ornaments of the churches were removed. All the tabernacles holding the body of the Lord were taken away. And the sacred host was thrown on the ground or in the fire or crushed underfoot or roasted in skillets or broken in a hundred pieces. All of the relics were stripped of the silver in which they were encased and the relics thrown away. And this is actually written by an occupying Spanish soldier. Afterwards, when our forces were in power without any opposition, the sack began without respect for any class of person or for all the churches and monasteries of friars and monks and St. Peter's the dwelling of the Pope. In no church there remained chalice, nor paten, nor thing of gold or silver. The monstrances with the holy sacrament and holy relics were thrown to the ground to take away their casings. The vestments and other ornaments, not sparing anything, were all stolen without any reverence, with such defiance as if they, the soldiers, were Turks. And on the subject of grave robbing, an example for Tenochtitlan, according to Cortez's third, third letter to Emperor Charles V. The Spaniards did as I commanded, and a half hour after midday, I set out for the city with the 30 horsemen. When I arrived, I left my companions in the aforementioned houses, and I myself climbed the high tower, pyramid, as I am accustomed to do. While I was present, some Spaniards opened a grave, which contained more than 1,500 castellanos worth of gold ornaments. And two grave robbing accounts. Hello. There we go. From Rome. I don't believe your lordship can even imagine, but rather it will seem a thing of dreams and not true. And through torture, they, the soldiers, have discovered money and jewels and clothing that were hidden in the fields and have opened the vaults of the burials in search of these. And no, there no man can enter in the church nor walk around Rome for the prodigious stench of the dead. Soldiers profaned all the temples and slew men above the altar of St. Peter. They broke open the urn or tomb in which the bones of St. Peter and Paul were resting and profaned the relics themselves. They have stolen chalices and ornaments and dedicated to divine service from all the temples, chapels, and monasteries of the whole city. Now, of course, all these quotations are literary representations of what happened in Tenochtitlan in Rome. But it's striking that these literary representations, some written from the point of view of the conquerors, Cortes, a Spanish soldier in Rome, and others written from the point of view of the victims, describe the horrors of urban warfare in such parallel terms. And this is something, actually, that James H. McGregor pointed out in his translation of Luigi Guicciardini's uh, Gui The Sack of Rome in a, beef, in, a, bleh, in a brief but provocative 1992 Columbus quincentenary era meditation on comparative early modern violence in both Europe and the Americas. Quote, Spanish and German troops of the Emperor Charles V carried out that invasion and sack of Rome. Spanish troops of the same emperor also raped, murdered, and tortured the Aztecs and Incas and pillaged and burned their cities. The horrors visited on the New World were not unique to our Western Hemisphere. Spanish troops did not throw away the rule book and run amok when they left Europe behind. They brought the common culture and practices of soldiers, officers, and political leaders with them to this Western Hemisphere. What happened in Tenochtitlan in 1521 happened again in Rome in 1527. Part two, into the east. So, as you've just heard, Hernan Cortes was an inveterate letter writer and document signer. He didn't just write letters to the emperor, and so thanks to the paperwork he generated, we can track his movements month by month from 1528 to 1529. So, he signs a document in the port city of Veracruz on February 21st, 1528, so he's still in the Americas. And then he left from Veracruz to begin a month and a half on average trip across the Atlantic to southwestern Spain. Now, an account of Cortes' trip by Diaz del Castillo says the entourage filled two ships in Veracruz and that the voyage crossed in record time, 42 days. 
Vexingly, we don't know exactly when Cortes arrived in Spain. Uh, he seems to have landed not in the inland port of Seville, but rather in coastal Palos, where one of his soldiers was from, where one of his pilots was from. Cortes's entourage then handed overland to Seville. A book of economic records in Seville's House of, uh, of Seville's House and Trade, a book now in the Archive of the Indies in Seville, seems to suggest Cortes's ships arrived on May 15th, 1521, but I'm still working on this, so I won't go into the details. Diaz del Castillo also says that Cortes and his entourage only spent a couple of days in Seville before continuing on to the Holy Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe, located in the mountains of, of Extremadura, where Co the region Cortes was from. And indeed, a June 5th, 1528 letter uh, by Cortes is written from Guadalupe, so we know he and his entourage actually did go there. Now, this might seem like a long distance to travel in just a couple of weeks from Palos to Guadalupe, but actually it was not. And here in Promised, we get to the fascinating topic of early modern roadway infrastructure and overland travel speeds. So, two key sources here. Source one, in 1914, uh, Manuel Fronda y Aguilera published a book on the sojourns and voyages of Emperor Charles V. So basically, he went through all of the decrees that Charles V signed throughout his life, decrees that were always dated and always indicated the city, the place that they were written in. So he was thus able to reconstruct a day-by-day -day account of where Charles V was throughout his reign. And using this, we can calculate how far he traveled day-by-day -day when he was traveling. I've looked at his movements from 1528 and 1529, and basically Charles V travels at a rate of 25 to 40 kilometers a day, depending. Crucially, although Charles V himself traveled on horseback or on a palanquin, the emperor was accompanied by dozens of courtiers who were on foot. And the same would have been true for Cortes. Horses are expensive, they re require a lot of space and money for upkeep. Uh, even if you know how to ride a horse, you may not have access to one. So, Using Charles V's travel speeds, it was totally possible for Cortes's entourage to cover the nearly 400 kilometers from Seville to Guadalupe in two weeks. And I won't bore you with the math. So source two on early modern road infrastructure is the rather amazing Repertory of All the Roads of Spain, published by Juan Viuga in 1546. So basically, this is an inventory of all the major roadways in Spain, town by town. So that there's a chapter on how to get from Barcelona to Seville, a chapter on how to get from Valencia to Guadalupe, etc. So using this book, scholars have reconstructed the road networks it describes, which is what you see here. Now, these were, of course, not the only roadways in 16th century Spain, but they were the ones important enough to bother writing a book about, and these are probably the road networks over which Cortes and his entourage traveled. So, Cortes, from Palos to Seville to Guadalupe. Now, Guadalupe is interesting not only because it is currently Cortes' first auto-documented stop in Spain, but also because his visit there seems to have left material traces at the shrine of the Virgin Mary, traces which may point to the actions of the central Mexicans traveling with him as well. In 1597, a history of the shrine of Guadalupe was published, and it mentions a number of gifts supposedly given by Cortes, uh, a jewel in the shape of a lizard, uh, which was illustrated in a book on the Guadalupe treasury from 1778, also a silver lamp, and finally, featherwork paintings displayed in 1597 in the Chapel of the Angels, quote, which the great Fernand Cortes sent to Our Lady. Now, as you probably know, featherwork mosaic images of Catholic divinities were, are a famous aspect of the art of 16th century are a famous aspect of art from 16th century Mexico. Now, unfortunately, the Guadalupe featherworks don't seem to have survived. I hope to look at 16th and, 8th and uh, 17th and 18th century inventories of Guadalupe to see if I can find out more. But of course, I'm tempted to ask, who gifted these featherwork paintings? Was it Cortes or was it his central Mexican fellow travelers? Gifting was no less a European practice than a Mesoamerican one. Uh, the central Mexican travelers would, as we'll see shortly, present featherwork gifts to Charles V in Madrid in August 1528. In April 1529, the Central Mexicans offered gifts of gold work to Pope Clement VII in Rome. And decades later, in the 1550s, when Central Mexicans from Tlaxcala were preparing to send another embassy to Spain, uh, the Tlaxcalan town council records described the creation of featherwork flowers for the voyage. So, featherwork in Guadalupe, fascinating detail. Cortes's entourage then heads on to Toledo, and then to Madrid. And in Madrid, on July 15th, 1528, Cortes writes a letter to Charles V, who is then at meetings in coastal Valencia. 
Charles V enters Madrid a few weeks later, on August 4th, 1528, a Tuesday. And that Sunday, August 9th, 1528, there seems to have been a reception for the Central Mexicans with Charles V. And we know this because of a rather extraordinary letter in German discovered a couple years ago in an archive in Nuremberg. And here, thanks to Paul Pucker of the Moravian Church Archives, I have a translation. I won't read the whole thing, but basically, uh, key points. The letter says that 40 Central Mexicans traveled with Cortez, Central Mexican nobles traveled with Cortez, and that the first Sunday Charles V was in Madrid, uh, they presented Charles V with gifts of featherwork, weapons, shields, and helmets, as well as gold jewels in the shape of turtles, snakes, and other animals. The Central Mexicans wore loincloths, as well as feather capes worn over the left shoulder. However, they had often also been gifted European-style clothing by Charles V. Uh, nevertheless, quote, they do not like the clothes, they cannot walk well in them, unquote. The letter also describes the facial jewelry of the Central Mexicans, quote, precious stones or gold on both sides of their noses, unquote, as well as labyrinths in their lips. And the letter also describes the Central Mexican ball players and log jugglers. And the letter ends saying, quote, when I, when I write to you next time, I will send you a picture, unquote. Uh, it's an amazing letter. Alas, there's no information on the promised picture. Uh, and I want to highlight three things. First, the reference to 40 Native American visitors, which corroborates the 1520s economic records in Seville that specify 39 Central Mexican noble travelers. Second, the reference to European-style clothing gifted to, the noble, gifted to the noble visitors about more soon. And third, the descriptions of facial jewelry, labrets in the lips, and jewels on either sides of the nose. Charles V is in, is in Madrid for a month, and then on October 9th, 1528, he heads for Toledo. A few days before he leaves, on October 2nd, Charles V writes a letter to the House of Trade in Seville, listing the names of 36 of the Native American visitors, and also describing the clothing that should be provided for them when they get to Seville. However, October is very late in the year for a transatlantic journey across the Atlantic, so the Me Central Mexicans at this point don't leave for Seville. Instead, they and Cortez follow the emperor to Toledo, where they all spend the winter. So let's pause at this point for another micro-historical anecdote about the new clothes that were to be provided for the Central Mexicans when they got to Seville. And we can call this anecdote Charles V fashion designer. So Charles V's October 2nd, 1528 letter describes two sets of outfits that to be provided for the visitors. One set for the highest level nobles, including the sons of Moctezuma, and another set for lower level courtiers. The highest level nobles were to have white shirts, yellow damask doublets, blue velvet skirted vests, cochineal red capes and hose, and blue velvet caps. The courtiers were to have white shirts, white doublets, yellow skirted vests, purple capes, and cochineal red caps. Now, it was actually quite common for the emperor to, to provide clothing as gifts, especially to his representatives, broadly speaking, who are about to cross the Atlantic. There's lots of information on these gifts in House of Trade economic registers. Jumping ahead in our story, when the Central Mexicans return to Seville in April 1529, the clothes are actually made as specified. We have detailed records of who the cloth was bought from and who the tailors and seamstresses were. And if we compare the costs of these outfits with those provided for the costs of the outfits provided for Franciscan friars or for non-cloistered religious women, beatas, we see that a lot of money was actually spent on the Central Mexican clothes. Now, just because Charles V signs the October 2nd, 1528 letter about the clothes, that doesn't necessarily mean he actually decided the color schemes for the outfits. However, we do know that Charles V was very conscious of self-fashioning through fashion. Most famously, two years later, in 1530, uh, when he received his second and third crowns as Holy Roman Emperor in Bologna, Charles V totally changes his look for his triumphal entry into that Italian city. He got rid of his clean-shaven, page-boy haircut, Burgundian noble look, and instead grew a beard and got a short haircut in the style of Roman emperors. So basically remakes himself to look, for example, like the Emperor Hadrian. So given this fashion consciousness, it's totally possible that Charles V did personally plan the color schemes for the central out Mexican outfits in 1528. Now, I'm not sure how to fully think through all of these out through all of this, the outfits, Charles V fashion designer, etc. So if anybody has thoughts, do let me know. 
So again, the, the outfit designs are written up October 2nd, 1528. A few days later, the royal household transfers to Toledo and spends the winter there. Now, when in Toledo, probably early in 1529, an artist from the Germanys arrives who wants an audience with his emperor. And this artist is Christoph Weiditz from Augsburg. Now, during his travels across Europe, Weiditz makes sketches of a number of different costumes he sees, most famously including sketches of Cortez and several of the central Mexicans. Uh, here you see the log jugglers, and here are two of the ball players. Now, I don't have time today to go talk about the 100 sketches in this costume book, which are pretty amazing, but I will point out that the one group most represented are the Basques, with 19 images, followed by Muslims and Native Americans, with 13 images each. And so if we go by numbers, the people Vitus encountered who were most strange for him were other Europeans, the Basques. And these images really tell a story in which difference is not easily reduced to hierarchy. Uh, a Spanish woman from Santander going to church is just as covered up with clothing as is a Muslim woman from Granada, and both of their outfits echo the encompassing cloth draperies of a Castilian peasant. Today I just want to pause on the facial jewelry worn by the Native American entertainers, and this has caused a lot of debate. The cheek piercings are not actually Mesoamerican, uh, but rather Brazilian. Uh, Brazilian nobles wore lip labyrinths as well. The forehead jewels and next slide. Yes, the forehead jewels are probably totally total fantasy. However, thinking back to that letter in German from Madrid, August 1528, note that Weiditz's men wear labyrinths as well as those nose jewels the, vers the German visitor described. Now, nose ornaments were an important at form of Mesoamerican jewelry, although in the 15th and 16th centuries, they seem to have been used only by the highest level elites. In contrast, those painted entertainers, as I mentioned, are probably slaves of Cortez. In other words, the facial jewelry here is a weird mix of elite Mesoamerican jewelry applied to the faces of slaves, mashed up with fantasy, and with the jewelry of Brazilian elites as well. So back to our timeline. The court witches in Toledo, and in the spring, on March 8, 1529, Charles V and his retinue leave Toledo, traveling east to Saragossa and then to Barcelona, from which, the travel, from which the court travels by sea to Italy, ending up in Bologna for, as I mentioned, the imperial coronation early in, uh, early in 1530. Cortez stays behind in Toledo, and later in March, he travels west to Bejar for his second wedding. Most of the central Mexicans travel south to Seville, where they arrive April 9th, 1529. Four of the Central Mexicans, however, seem to travel with Cortez to, I'm sorry, with Charles V to Zaragoza, and then continue on separately to Rome, where they probably arrive on Monday, April 12th, 1529. And this brings us at last to part three, at the Butterfly House. So Rome is a very well-documented city in the 16th century, above all because it was a city with a practice of having permanent foreign embassies was first established. Italy, Italy at this time was, of course, divided into a number of small states. So Venice had a resident ambassador in Rome, as did Siena, Bologna, Mantua, as well as Spain, France, etc. These ambassadors were constantly writing letters back home. Many of these survive, and so one, one can often track events in Rome day by day by comparing the letters written by different ambassadors. That said, vexingly, the Spanish ambassador in Rome doesn't write any letters from early April 1529 to early May 1529, which is extremely vexing, obviously. And uh, I haven't located any ambassadorial reports that actually refers to the central Mexican visit. I still have some archives to check, so fingers crossed. Nevertheless, at least three of these ambassadors, one Venetian and two Mantuan, describe the arrival of a shipment of letters from Spain via Genoa on Monday, April 12th, 1529. So this is probably when the Central Mexicans arrived. So what did they encounter in post-conquest Rome? I'm imagining telling the story on two different levels. Uh, first, talking about Rome, what Rome was like physically in general, and second, tracking the basic route that the Central Mexicans must have traveled when in the city, and what particular traces of the sack they would have encountered uh, on that route. Now, in terms of generalities, remember that the occupation of Rome had ended just over a year before the Central Mexicans arrived. The occupying troops left in late February 1528, and the Pope himself only came back in early October 1528, and then winter set in. One of the key sources for what
Rome was like post-sac, are of course letters of ambassadors, especially the first letters that ambassadors write when they return to the post-conquest city. In terms of general statistics, uh, the spring 1528 diary of Cornelius de Fien says that two-thirds of the city's houses were destroyed. An October 7th, 1528 letter by the Mantuan ambassador says that four-fifths of the houses in Rome were uninhabitable. And these are roughly comparable statistics of devastation, two-thirds being 66% and four-fifths being 80%. Additionally, and this is hard for me to believe, when the French writer Rabelais visits Rome in 1535, he says that the eastern part of the city, that is, what is now the center of Rome, east from the Vatican across the Tiber, was still, quote, desperate from the sack of the Lance Knights. So these are some big picture images of Rome and ruins from 1528 to 1535. In micro-material terms, the destruction of Rome architecturally seems to have resulted not only from the burnings at the time of the invasion, but also from the months of occupation of the city. Basic supply chains had broken down, of course, homage to Brodel. And over and over again, writers describe how the occupying troops supplied themselves with firewood by tearing out the wooden frames of house doors and of windows and floor planks and ceiling beams and burning them. So in May 1527, Spanish envoy Antonio Perez wrote this to Charles V. Occupied Rome was, quote, being gradually destroyed so that in a very short time it will be a heap of ruins. As most of the wealthy citizens desert their homes for fear of having soldiers quartered upon them, it naturally follows that the moment the owners are gone, the houses are gutted and pulled down for the sake of the timber, which is sold in markets and public spaces as firewood, as cheap as if there were a large forest in the neighborhood of Rome. At the same time, uh, spring 1527, Roman citizen and public notary uh, Teodoro Waldarino wrote in his diary that, quote, they, the soldiers, have burned innumerable houses and all the windows and doors of the houses where they did not live and burned innumerable floors and roofs and the nails and other ironwork that they pulled out and sold to sailors at the Ripa port on the Tiber. A year later, spring 1528, uh, Cornelius de Fien, who we met earlier, writes, Quote, the troops had destroyed and burnt down the city, and two-thirds of the houses were swept away. Doors, windows, and every bit of woodwork, even to the roof beams, was consumed by fire. And that fall, on October 20th, 1528, the returning Sienese ambassador, uh, John O'Calva, wrote, quote, Here one awaits the repair of doors and windows, and the cleaning of houses, and each one prepares and organizes and orders as best they can. But to tell the truth, on seeing this Rome, it appears a shell or a crate of wood compared to what Rome was before the sack. Now, this micro-devastation may have even affected the Vatican. Uh, in an amazing book of Vatican economic records that for, uh, from the late 1520s that for complicated reasons ended up in the State Archive of Florence, there are a pair of entries for 1529, the first undated, the second dated August to December, which involved payments for keys and locks on the doors in the Vatican Palace. Quite possibly the keys and locks were being replaced because the original doors and their metalwork had all been burned and melted during the sack. And there are also lots of references to carpentry in this book of economic records that I still need to work through. Now, as it happens, Mesoamerican houses also had doors with wooden, lid, wooden lintels, painted red here. And Central Mexican historian James Lockhart points out that later in the 16th century, at least, Nahuatl wills often included specific bequests of wooden door lintels and columns, implying these were carefully worked, expensive parts of homes. And Matthew Restall has found the same door lintel inheritance patterns among the Maya of Yucatan. In other words, Central Mexican visitors to Rome will probably have noticed all the missing woodwork based on their own architectural traditions. So that's a very quick sketch of some of the ways I'm thinking about imagining the physical fabric of post-conquest Rome generally. And now I'll sketch out the basics of where the Central Mexicans must have gone in Rome, using the 1555 Pinar map as a basic framework, and north is more or less to your left. So the Central Mexicans would have sailed from Barcelona, and then made a stop in Genoa, and then down to Ostia, Rome's uh, coastal port, there, they would have traveled up the Tiber to Ripa, Rome's inland port, which also had a customs house. And just as general illustrations, here's an image from the 15th century of the port and another one from the mid-16th century. Uh, and we've just been in Ripa a couple of minutes ago. This is where, quote, nails and other ironwork from doors were pulled out and sold to sailors on the Ripa port. 
They would have then moved to the Chancellery Palace, a key neoclassical building constructed in the late 15th century. And as it happens, part of this palace was home of the resident Spanish ambassador. So arguably, this was the building where the Central Mexicans stayed when they were in Rome. It was very near, it is very near, the Piazza Navona, or the site of the Church of Santiago, or St. James of the Spaniards, the uh, National Spanish Church in Rome, which has a great archive I need to consult. Then, across the Ponte Sant'Angelo, there we go, and most importantly, they would have then gone to St. Peter's and the Vatican. And this is the part of the story I've had the most archival success with. It's been known since the 19th century that on April 16th, 1529, Hernán Cortés was granted a series of bulls by the Pope because copies of these bulls were found in the archive of the Hospital of Jesus in Mexico City, which is a hospital Cortés founded. Now, as we saw above, we know from his letters that Cortés didn't go to Rome, but papal bulls could be granted by proxy. So when I started working on this project in August 2019, I wrote to the Vatican Archives and asked if there happened to be any other bulls uh, issued for Mexican themes in, from August 1529. The archivist kindly checked the registers and said yes, there were some for Cortez and also some others for Mexico. So I ordered copies and added additional pages before and after the official page raids just in case. And when those copies arrived, they can, included not only the bulls for Cortez, but also four bulls for specific named Native Americans in, sp in, sp in support of specific churches in central Mexico. And even in the extra pages I ordered just in case, uh, a bull about the knighthood of the conquistador chaperone of the central Mexicans, Juan de Rada, who Bernal Diaz says was sent to Rome as Cortez's representative and probably requested the bulls for Cortez in Cortez's name. However, since the bulls for Cortes were granted by proxy, it was also possible that the bulls for the Central Mexicans were also granted by proxy. Fortunately, almost a year later in Florence, going through that book of 1520s Vatican economic records I mentioned, I came across four entries for Vatican payments for gifts for the Central Mexicans. Two payments to goldsmith uh, Pompeo di Capitaneis for making a gold necklace, and he also happens to be, alas, the goldsmith famously murdered by Benvenuto Cellini, and two payments uh, to a tailor for clothes, which include a key detail. The clothes are for Cuatro Indiani, four Indians, and that's what's in the final line of text here. All of which is amazing in Rome documentation that the Central Mexicans really were there. Now, I've spent a lot of time in my Fernand Brodel mode learning about the paper, <coughs> excuse me, the paperwork process of actually getting a papal bull granted in 1520s Rome. So a media archaeology of the papal bureaucracy. Now, I'm sure you're all disappointed. I can't go into all the details today. But basically, uh, step one is an audience with the Pope, where the bull is granted. And the day of the audience, of the day of the audience is the day the bull is valid from. Then, after the audience, there follows a week or longer process of actually physically getting an official copy of the bull drafted up. First, the granted bull, its contents are entered in the, into the supplication registry books, which were housed in the Vatican office building next to the Apostolic Palace. The office building no longer exists, but uh, basically it was along the northern side of the patio in front of Old St. Peter's, which is highlighted in red here. I'm sure you're all happy. I spent a lot of effort to find out where the Vatican office building was, and now I can actually show you wonderfully. Um, next, supplicants travel across town to the Chancellery Palace, which again is where the Central Mexicans were probably staying. Um, and there, uh, in a series of ground floor rooms filled with desks, the parchment copy of the bull and it, with official phrasing and tons of validating signatures was written up, and lots of notaries get paid for different steps in physically preparing the parchment bull. And finally, part three is the parchments are taken back across the Tiber, back to the Vatican office building, where the ribbons and authenticating lead seals are applied. The word bull, of course, comes from Latin bulla, referring to these lead seals. But the first step was an audience with the Pope. So where on Friday, April 16th, 1529, did this actually take place? So in a famous essay, which I'm sure most of you have read, uh, from 1972 by John Shearman, uh, he talks about the constantly changing uses of rooms in the Vatican's apartments during the first three decades of the 16th century. Clement VII seems to have favored the third floor Sala dei Chiaroscuri for most of his business, and it's here highlighted in yellow. This was a room right outside his private apartments and chapel, which are here in red and blue. Uh, he held concert stories there, public receptions, and his body was even laid out in the yellow room after his death. 
So this room was very conveniently located for public access as well. Basically, how do you get there? You enter the north, northernmost, no, bleh, northernmost door in the Vatican's public facade, and here's a famous drawing by Martin Van Heemskerk from the mid-1530s, and uh, the arrow is where you go in, and here's a version of ground, ground plan of the palace, ground plan again, you head up a flight of monumental stairs, here you are on the first floor, and then up on the second floor, come on, uh, you enter the door, which is basically right where the stairs come out. You pass through the Swiss guards room, which is here in purple, and then onto the Sala dei Chiaroscuri, which is here in yellow, uh, which is right next to the famous Sala di Constantino here in orange. Here is the Sala dei Chiaroscuri, as seen when you first enter it. Uh, to your left is the wall with the doors that lead to the papal apartments, and the chapel door is to the very far left. So this room is originally frescoed by Raphael around 1517 to 1519. It's less famous today than the other Raphael Stanze room, uh, uh, rooms around the corner. Uh, and note the green room here is where the School of Athens fresco and Disputa frescoes are that we looked at earlier. The room is less famous because in the 1540s, Raphael's frescoes were mostly redone by another artist. And then a few decades later, another fresco campaign uh, tried to restore Raphael's original design. That original design was more or less as you see it here today. Uh, there were a series of chiaroscuro saints and apostles in architectural niches. On top of the niches were a set of animals painted by Raphael's assistant, Giovanni da Udine. There was the famous Hanu the elephant, a civet cat, parrots. Uh, Tristan Vedigan, who studied this room in detail, points out that most of these animals were originally given as diplomatic gifts to Pope Leo X. So the menagerie was symbol symbolically appropriate for a reception cha chamber. Unfortunately, none of the frescoed animals survived today, which is a huge disappointment, obviously. Uh, but a few watercolors of animals by Giovanni da Udine do survive, which are charming, and I'm just throwing them in here as uh, illustrations because they are so charming. And this is the world's greatest Renaissance chameleon portrait, as I'm sure you all agree. What does survive of the original 15 teens frescoes is part of the putti frieze on the upper wall and the bodies of some of the saints and apostles in the niches. So no animals, but putti and apostles. Now, as I said, Tristan Vedigan has done an amazing study of these frescoes. And one way we can date the different frescoed surfaces in the room is because visitors to the room sometimes scratch the date of their visits onto the plaster surface. Now, rather extraordinarily, on the plastered surface of St. Luke, who is with his cow in the corner surrounding the door entering to the private papal chapel, is apparently the date, 16 April, 1529. Now, I haven't seen any photos of this graffito, so to be continued, but at the very least, the incised date suggests that the room was open to visitors on April 16, 1529, adding to support to the idea that this is the very room where Clement VII met the four Central Mexicans and perhaps was even entertained by the log jugglers. Bernal Diaz del Castillo describes them specifically and may or may not describe them as human gifts from Cortes to the Pope. Cortes, quote, sent us his ambassador, an Hidalgo named Juan de Rada, who with him he brought a rich present of precious stones and gold jewels and two Indian experts at juggling logs with their feet. The two other Central Mexican visitors, as I mentioned at the start, were nobles Benito de Rada Masatokeni, who was granted a bull for a church in Tlaxcala, and Hernando de Tapia, son of the indigenous governor of Mexico City, who was granted a bull in the name of his father Andres for a church in Mexico City. And I'll get to these churches in a second, but I want to end part three with two final points. First, some details, some final details on April 16th, 1529. Now, thanks to one of the Mantuan ambassadors, we know that Clement VII <clears throat> was holding public audiences during these spring weeks from two to six in the afternoon. Furthermore, from this and another of a, 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 num a number of other ambassadorial letters, we know the timing of the central Mexican visit was lucky. Because on April 16th, 1529, so a really important date for my story, probably at dinner, which would have been eaten at sunset, which would have been around 8 p.m. on April 16th, Charles, I'm sorry, Clement VII ate a dish of fresh fava beans, fave fresche, according to Mantuan ambassador Fabrizio Pellegrino. Clement VII then fell ill and was unable to pub hold public audiences for almost a week. 
Uh, perhaps, as David Kim suggested to me, suffering from favismo, which is an allergic reaction to fava beans. And note this charming image search result for the word favismo. On April 18th, the Modenese ambassador, Antonio Romeo, writes that Clement had been sick for two days. So since April 18th minus two is the 16th. On April 19th, Mantuan ambassador, Fabrizio Pellegrino, writes that Clement had been sick for three days and blames the fresh fava beans. And on April 20th, Mantuan ambassador, Francesco Gonzaga, writes that Clement had been sick for four days. Now in Italy, the first fava beans of the season are usually ready in April or May. And April 16th, 1529 was before the Gregorian calendar reforms of 1580, so effectively seasonally, April 16th, 1529 was more like today's April 27th. So perhaps Clement VII was very excited to have the year's first fresh fava beans, and then something went wrong. The other point I want to end this section on also happens to deal with vegetables. So let's look briefly at the Church of St. Peter's, which the Central Mexicans surely visited in 1529. And here, appropriately, we return to the themes in that Nahua poem about Rome with which we began. How did Rome look through Mesoamerican eyes? Now, famously and controversially, early in the 16th century, the late antique Basilica of St. Peter's began to be demolished in order to make way for the massive dome church that exists today. You would enter uh, the courtyard in front of St. Peter's via another door in the Vatican's jumbled facade. And here's the Heemskirk, Heemskirk image again. And the arrow shows you the door. And here's an aerial view of a map from later in the 16th century. Basically, the patio is in red. And beyond, you can see the domed, uh, the cylinder for the dome of St. Peter's, which is under construction. Construction on the new St. Peter's took most of the 16th century, and so for much of the 16th century, it was a strangely ruined place. And here's another Heemskirk image from the 1530s. The ceiling of the old basilica had been removed, and you see the old walls here left and right. Um, and at center, there was a small temporary structure with a roof which had to be built to shelter priests during mass. Looming over the walls of the old church uh, were for decades the half-finished walls of, Saint, of the new St. Peter's. So, sacred buildings, inside sacred buildings, inside sacred buildings. This would have been very familiar to the Central Mexicans because Central Mexican pyramids, too, were enlarged by building new shells around an older core. And here is a classic example from the Great Temple at the center of Tenochtitlan, where you can see the various layers of older and newer staircases, one outside the other. But perhaps the most amazing example of the strangely familiar for Central Mexicans in 1520s Rome would have been what they encountered in the large patio in front of the facade of old St. Peter's. There in the middle was a, so a small structure housing what had once been an antique fountain. At the center of the fountain was a giant bronze pine cone, originally gilded, but at this point green with age, and on the roof were a series of antique bronze peacocks. All of these bronze components survive today. Now, although there, although there were, of course, pine cones in the Americas, surely to Central Mexican visitors, this would have looked like nothing so much as a giant cob of maize, echoing the thousand-year-old greenstone celts, effigy maize cobs, we know the Aztecs collected. The weathered bronze peacocks, with their green color and long tails, would surely have echoed Mesoamerican quetzal birds whose long green tail feathers were highly valued for Central Mexican headdresses and were indeed compared to the leaves of maize stalks. A vivid green monument to maize at the heart of the Vatican. What did the Central Mexicans think of this? Or did it just seem so obvious they didn't give it much thought? Part four, going home. On July 27, 1529, Benito Massaplacani arrived in Seville, rejoining his companions after his Rome trip. And this again, according to those 1520s House of Trade economic record, re records I keep talking about. The documents also relieve that Hernando de Tapia decided to stay behind in Madrid or Toledo. And what happened to the two log jugglers who went to Rome, I'm not sure. Again, to be continued pending more archival work. The Central Mexicans stay in Seville until August 17th, 1529. They then travel down the Guadalquivir River to San Lucar on the Atlantic coast. And then in late August, they set sail to return to Mexico. Now I'm almost out of time, but I want to think briefly about the churches that the April 1529 papal bulls were issued to support. 
Uh, the language of the bulls follows standard papal boilerplate. Some of the phrasings had been used since at least the 15th century. And basically, the bulls name a specific central Mexican man as a parishioner at a specific church in a specific town. And the bulls authorize the establishment of a once a year holy day in each of the churches, specific date not indicated. And those who visited the church on that holy day would receive, quote, the full forgiveness and remission of their sins. Now, none of the buildings for any of these churches survives today. Uh, this is all happening very early, a decade after Catholicism first arrives in Mesoamerica. But some of the named churches as institutions do still survive today. To keep things short, I'll only talk about my favorite example out of the four. Uh, and this is the bull granted to, in the name of Andres de Tapia for Mexico City. And here to illustrate, I'm using the 1550s Santa Cruz map now in Uppsala, and north is to your right. Now, Tapia's bull is not granted for Mexico City's centrally located cathedral, which was built next to the Aztec Great Temple, which we just saw an image of. Rather, the bull is granted for the Church of St. Paul, which was the local neighborhood church of the parish of, of St. Paul, which was one of the four Native American divisions of the city. And it was the part of Mexico City that Roman pilgrim Hernando de Tapia came from. So even though Hernando's father, Andres, was governor of the city of Mexico overall, his son, when in Rome, petitions a, built a bull to support their home neighborhood church, not the city's central cathedral. Coda. I want to end with a very brief coda on two points. <clears throat> the first is to how this project relates generally to the writing of connected histories linking Europe and the Americas. There's, of course, a long history of debating the importance and impact of the Americas on the history of early modern Europe, uh, economic impacts above all. In contrast, when I've been writing, uh, when I've been thinking about the so what of my own project, uh, I've been struck by the writing of history itself. When I started this research, I assumed that Rome, being a very important and very famous city, already had its history fully written. So that in order to tell my narrative of a Central Mexican visit, I would just have to find documents on the Central Mexicans and then add them to a history of Rome in the late 1520s that was already thoroughly written. But actually, this wasn't the case. Very little has been written on Rome in the years after the sack, the years I'm interested in. Most histories of Renaissance Rome focus on the history of the city up to 1527, so up to the sack, and then pick up again in the mid-1530s with the urban reforms of Pope Paul III. The history of a devastated city in recovery is not the sort of triumphant history that past historians of Rome have been interested in. In other words, to tell one untold story, that of central Mexicans in Rome in 1529, I actually have to research and write another untold story, that of the urban recovery of Rome itself. Thus, writing a new history of Native Americans in Europe requires me simultaneously to write a new history of Europe itself, focused on one of its most important cities. So catalytic uh, role in thinking about how history gets rewritten. To end, I want to comment on the music you heard at the beginning. This was a motet by Vatican composer Constanzo Festa, and it's a motet rediscovered in a manuscript in a Roman library in the late 1940s. In other words, rediscovered in the Roman ruins of Italian neorealism. The guy who first reported on the manuscript, Edward Lewinsky, argued that this motet setting of Psalm 79 was a musical meditation by Festa on the sack of Rome. The psalm describes the sacking of Jerusalem. O God, the heathen are come into thine inheritance. Thy holy temple have they defiled. They have laid Jerusalem on heaps. Uh, the dead bodies of thy servants have they given to be meat unto the fowls of the heavens, the flesh of thy saints unto the beasts of the earth. Their blood have they shed like water round about Jerusalem, and there was none to bury them. So a final comment on Euro-American historical relations. In the late 1520s, the heathens defining Rome were not central Mexican converts to Catholicism, but rather former Catholic German soldiers who had converted to Protestantism. Thank you very much. I could take a couple questions, sure. Would you like some more water? Oh, I, I'm all set. I, uh, <laughs> thank you very much, though.
Thanks, Byron. That was um, fantastic. Uh, such a um, such an incredible landscape that you sketched out for us of an amazing event. But I guess I want to ask um, a question about um, your role in focusing the lens, as it were, and how do you go about in this really broad uh, project choosing areas to zoom in on. So I was particularly struck by um, your reading, not of the Bicelli, <laughs> although I'm tempted to ask a question about that, but about the pine cone, the pine cone fountain at St. Peter's. How did you, in your kind of survey of the Rome that would have been experienced by these visitors, choose that monument as one to sort of unpack and um, consider vis-a-vis -vis formal likenesses with the visual culture of um, your, your, your visitors. Because it seems to me that there, of course, you've um, shown this moment of destruction that three, what did you say, four-fifths of the city is in ruins. Um, so that's going to limit the amount that you are looking at. But um, it just seemed kind of curious to me to zoom in on one thing in particular and have it open up a, an interpretation for you. Um, and I was wondering about how you do that, how as a historian and reading through the documents and sort of imagining yourself walking through the city, do you pick something and how does that, how do you feel certain that that's a, uh, a historically responsible thing to do? So, um, again, we, one of the challenges of the project is that we don't have actual accounts written by the Central Mexicans themselves. So part of what the project hopes to do is kind of think of a comp about a comparative Mediterranean Mesoamerican urbanism. Um, in the 80s, uh, James Lockhart, who I mentioned, a very important Nahua scholar at UCLA, wrote a couple of very interesting essays about what he called double mistaken identity, which he argues that it's very curious, I mean, both the Spaniards and the Aztecs uh, were these expansionist military societies. They both had elaborate priestly hierarchies. They both depended on tributary extraction from peasants. So there are lots of ways in which these are two weirdly parallel societies to be coming in contact with one another through this kind of, I mean, one military society is destroying another military society. So there's lots of commonalities. The idea of double mistaken identity is what are the limits to that? So. Spaniards think they're doing one thing that looks on the surface very similar. The Mesoamerican Nahuas are doing another thing that on the surface looks very similar. Because of surface similarities, they're able to have a kind of dialogue. Um, but in fact, they're doubly mistaken because actually, if we look deeper, both sides are, are, have very different premises behind this seemingly surface interaction, which nevertheless allows them to carry on both sides not really understanding the other, but managing to have a common ground of, uh, of superficial surface identity. So again, this idea of comparative Mesoamerican Mediterranean urbanism. I'm, one of the methods was trying to think about, well, what sorts of things in broadly Mesoamerican society, Mesoamerican urbanism, would have been parallel to what's going on in Rome. So the, the examples I gave today, uh, the idea of uh, layering sacred buildings inside sacred buildings, uh, the Nawas were uh, totally interested in archaeology, previous societies, the ruined, ruined sites surrounding them. So that would have been another resonance with, um, I mean, Mexico City, 45 minutes to the north, is a city called Teotihuacan, uh, which is abandoned like 500 years before Meso before Tenochtitlan was founded. We know the Aztecs traveled there. They bought objects and ceramics there. They built uh, Teot Teotihuacan revival buildings in Tenochtitlan itself. So antiquarianism would be one potential field to thinking about Mesoamerican urbanism brought to the Mediterranean, how they would have thought about that. Another culture of bathhouses, and apparently bathing is revived in Rome. There's a claim of this anyway, uh, basically reviving ancient, you know, classical Roman bathing bath cultures. So um, there's an amazing uh, dialogue called, I think it's called uh, play La Lozana Andalusa, which is about a Spanish working woman working in Rome. And it's filled with reference to the bathhouse culture in Rome. Um, 
Steam bathing was also something the Mesoamericans did, so that's potentially, if any of the bathhouses survive post-conquest uh, post -conquest Rome, that would be another point of comparison. Um, so, base, so the examples you got here are part of kind of a larger palette of trying to think about, again, Mesoamerican, Mediterranean urbanism. Um, uh, and the pine cone example, uh, first, again, it doesn't exist. And I actually, I saw the, the pine cone when I was first in Rome, and I was like, wow, it looks like a maize cob. And then I read more about it. And I was, uh, and it would have, it, the, the fountain was still in place. And when this is all going on, it hasn't been moved and assembled yet. So it just seemed like, again, one of these things that's still there that hasn't been destroyed by the sack at this particular moment, um, and it would soon be removed. Uh, so kind of a very temporally site-specific object um, that, you know, it could be a total fantasy and an irresponsible thing on my part. But again, if we don't have um, accounts by the Native Americans, how can we at least try to approach the ways they would have seen? And again, this bigger framework of trying to teach these two kinds of urbanism together. Um, so, um, yeah, does that sort of, so I guess the, 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 the narrow, you asked why choose that monument? Well, I guess hopefully it's going to be one of a series of things where I try to, to try to think through this kind of way of seeing. Did that answer your question sort of, or? Okay, great. Thanks, thanks. I have the next question. Um, great. And, um, you know, I, we talked a little bit uh, before your presentation about how I work on South Asia, and one of the things I was struck by was that uh, both the culture and uh, the culture of gifting and the culture of violence have um, attracted uh, so much attention over almost, um, I don't know, a couple of centuries <coughs> of historiography on the subject, and that uh, the codes, conventions, systems that govern the gift or that govern war, loot, trophy, and so on are so distinct. And I think you answered in part the question through that I might have had earlier about, uh, well, how do you um, reconcile two very different kinds of understandings with the answer that you gave Sarah? But I guess I'm going to ask a question nonetheless about your method, because when you said you're doing comparative work, and I'm thinking now about a lot of um, work around connected histories in the Indian Ocean world um, and elsewhere. Um, and um, it seems to me that you're focusing on resonance and connection or similarity, but not on difference, estrangement, uh, divergence, what would have come as a shock perhaps to the Central Americans. So I'm thinking back to your use of Braudel, and it seems like uh, the Braudel that you're going to are you know, it, most referring to as structures of everyday life, but the two concepts that I think of as most influential for thinking about, say, Indian Ocean world uh, histories and cosmopolitanisms are long durée and mentalité. Mm -hmm. And the mentalité or long durée ideas are both deep structure ideas, so the kind of superficial resemblance you're talking about, like they can do business, right? I mean, that's the kind of Obisekre Salins model um, or Nicholas Thomas model of thinking about exchange in the Pacific. But if you're going to use Braudel, even the structures of everyday life, these are deep structures, right? And th they're not about, oh, there's a passing resemblance between a pine cone and a, a maize cob or whatever, but it's like, what do these things do socially, spatially, and over time? Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that there's uh, potential here for thinking about difference as a mode of thinking comparison. Yeah, so I think the reason I stress, again, resonance, connection, similarity, is because it seems weird to me that these two stories haven't really been brought together together, and they haven't been brought together. I mean, that, that these two sacred cities are being destroyed at the same moment. Why, I mean, why haven't they been talked together? And this has to do with Europe is one place, area studies has described the Americas as another place, and I mean, even in Latin American studies today, you know, you can often, study Europe up until 1492, and then after that, it becomes irrelevant for the rest of the story. So, oh. I was just going to say, you probably know that my analog here is thinking about the history of, say, Western era, or the Middle East, or the Islamic world, and the history of South Asia. So there's tons of problems for thinking about the history of Western era, or Richard Davis, or Phil Wagner, you know, just knowing precisely the kind of work that you're describing. But they are writing violence into the, into the history, and, you know, competing Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, 
how, how do I want to go? Uh, so, uh, well, um, how do I want to respond to this? So, I guess superficially, I'm the, the emphasis on connection is just because connections haven't been made for these parts of the world, and they're obviously, uh, why, why is that? So that I think drives why I'm so interested in connection similarity. Um, in terms of um, what they would have found that would have shocked them, um, I mean, again, if I'm trying to, again, if only we had a kind of Montaigne dialogue uh, with Tupinamba that would allow us to get more at how, I, 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 what I want to say, how do I describe what would have shocked them without, uh, I just think, I'm not, I'm not articulating well. It just seems easier for me to think about possible comparison than, I mean, there are so many differences, right, between what Native Americans would have been used to in their cities and what they would have encountered uh, in Rome. Rome was probably totally filthy, right? Although at this point, Tenochtitlan has also been destroyed. Um, so just going for similarity and possi possibility seems to me, I mean, difference is so, if I were to try to describe all the ways in which Mesoamericans would have been shocked at what they found in Rome, that, I, I don't know, I guess I don't know how to approach that um, because the differences are so manifold, right? Um, I, mean, I, don't think I'm, I don't think I'm articulating myself very well here. Um, long do, uh, do you want to follow up on this? I'm, I'm, I'm not... No, no, these are great questions, so... By 1520s, and I think it's 1523-1525, chronicle of Domingo Paez to the city of Vijinagar. He comes through Goa um, and travels to Vijinagar, a uh, Portuguese horse merchant. And the account is full. I mean, there's a, there's a few other Portuguese accounts from the period of visiting the kingdom of Krishna Devaraya. But what this, what this traveler sees is, this is like Lisbon. This is like Rome. This is not like our horses. This is like our, you know, gold exchange. The king is a great man. I mean, the guy, the guy is cultivating a relationship with the king. But it's also like they do things very differently. And yet I can see these are um, trees that are very different from the trees that we know. This is, of course, we have lots of this for Europeans traveling to, say, Mexico. So they talk about tigers, all these kinds of resemblances. The issue is, though, trying to, given this is a very common model about what Europeans miss see, also kind of think about, well, what would happen, just as a thought experiment, how would that similar kind of misseeing or thinking about analogs happen the other way? So again, um, taking this kind of Europeans go to the Americas, we're used to that story, they see things, they misidentify things, sometimes because of their archaeological interest, they were interested in kinds of things, they had interlocutors that might surprise us, um, but just kind of reversing that, uh, reversing that kind of very common strategy. Um, I'd love to have a reference to this 1520s document you talk about. Um, well, I think... Oh, I, I mean, I, I, I think that's probably totally, totally the case, absolutely. But um, again, these are kind of, how do we, in, in, the, in, in the text, I mean, when I actually write this up, and maybe that wasn't clear tonight, this is very much, how do we think about this? How did Mesoamer how did Rome look through Mesoamerican eyes? I would not, yeah, I certainly don't claim this is what they actually thought. Um, but these are possibilities, and at the very least, even if it, this isn't what they actually thought, it at least forces... Europeanists who might not be interested in Latin America to think about what Mesoamerican cities were like and kind of the reverse. So if nothing else, it forces us now to think about these comparisons, again, in a world riven by area studies where those, where, you know, uh, Latin Americanists can not necessarily want to know anything about Europe, right? Which seems kind of weird for the early modern period, but that's how the structures of disciplines and how uh, history departments are often divided into Latin Americanists who are not Europeanists. Um, so, I don't know if I have a long joy mentality. Um, I guess the, the Bordel I'm mostly interested in is this kind of connection, the, the infrastructural Brodel. I, um, 
long durée and mentality. Well, I think mentality is partially coming up here, at least my sort of claims of what's going on there. What am I thinking about long durée? Um, yeah, I will, uh, I'll have to think more about um, uh, the deep structure thing. Yeah, I, I'm thinking like the amazing stuff in civilization and capitalism about, you know, how does water get circulated? Excuse me? No, he told, oh no, I'm sorry. In the Mediterranean, he's totally a history of episodes. That's how he puts together the Mediterranean book, right? It's all these fragments he describes. I'm not gonna treat, uh, I'm gonna treat mountains. I'm gonna treat deserts. Uh, it's filled with uh, micro-historical moments that he puts together to build up a larger framework. So I, I do think, at least in the Mediterranean, it's totally, so-and-so said this about getting the snow trade in 1672, and then in 1741, we can say this about the snow trade. The first example was from Seville, the second example is from uh, um, Israel, for example. So... Oh, all right. Thank you, I have the magic... Thank you for those questions. Uh, ...giant dice um, microphone. Um, I wanted to first just thank you for the really um, amazing place-based work that you have done to recover indigenous presence in so many different places in, uh, in the 1520s. It's, it's, it's remarkable and it was really enjoyable to follow, uh, to follow you through overland routes through Spain, through Rome, and back again. Um, I wanted to pick up on the term, if I'm remembering this correctly, that you introduced at the very beginning, the Mediterraneo Atlantic world, which I love. And I simply wanted to ask whether part of your project will also involve the oceanic world. Um, you know, your, your attention to material culture really got me interested in, in how, how one gets uh, from Tenochtitlan and Mexico City overland to the Atlantic, uh, you know, 40 indigenous people, presumably on a small ship, what are those conditions like? Where are the ships going? Are they stopping in Cuba? Are they stopping in San Juan? Are they stopping um, in islands off the west coast of Spain? So I'm thinking about the blue humanities here and the really important considerations of, of time and travel and oceanic uh, spaces as well, and whether there's an, whether there's any material to even try and recover indigenous presence on on those ocean worlds as well. Well, I, I assume you know Jace Weaver's wonderful The Red Atlantic, which uh, looks at that specific uh, indigenous Atlantic world question. Um, and actually, yes, the oceanic world, totally fascinating. As David mentioned, uh, I have a little essay called Field Notes from Solaris, which is looking at shipwrecks, which is precisely about you know, a critique of oceanic studies in which the ocean is sort of irrelevant. So how do you actually deal with the process of crossing salt water in the early modern period? Um, and I, I use ship's logs, which are generated day by day over time, and shipwrecks, which are when that day by day process of staying afloat um, collapses. So basically, ship's logs are kind of vertical horizon and shipwrecks are kind of horizontal horizon, one about a series of moments and the other about a, a catastrophe. So broadly, how do we think about the ocean? Yes, absolutely, I'm super interested in that. And in fact, one of the things that um, I was uh, uh, looking at Mr. Brodell for is uh, shipping speeds and how, so how long would it actually take on average to sail from Barcelona to get to Genoa, what are the normal tracks, uh, one, uh, one, what are the normal ports one would stay at? Um, again, to try to figure out this timeline of we can track the overland pretty clearly, but then when would they have had to leave Barcelona in order to arrive in Rome at that time? And Brodel is very frustrating on this because he says, well, it all depends. So, and then he gives a whole series of, here's this shipping route from this place to this place in 1526. Here's kind of the same basic thing in 1745, but it's totally different. So, basically I was doing a lot of the work on the, 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 um, the Barcelona to Genoa to Ostia, part of, uh, part of the story, trying to fill that in. And I didn't make it very far yet, but that's definitely to be continued. 
Um, and the Atlantic part, this is a, there's actually a debate as to whether the ship trails safe. Normally, one would sail from Veracruz to Cuba to Havana and then along the Atlantic. But then there's like a debate among, histor among 16th century writers. Um, basically, one writer says, oh, this guy talking about the trip uh, claims that they stopped on this island. But that's totally not true. They did not stop on the island. They went directly from uh, Veracruz uh, to Seville. So um, there's... So thinking about how the thinking about adding some texture to the Atlantic part of the crossing, that's also a debate that exists uh, in uh, in the 16th century already. And again, uh, they're not, Diaz del Castillo says that they crossed in record time, 42 days. So um, the short answer is yes, absolutely. Um, but I'm still wrestling with how to include the uh, the oceanic part into uh, into the more um, the infrastructure of what we know about roadway crossings. So thanks for that question. I think we have time for one more. So I'm gonna... uh, just briefly, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Mm -hmm. And if you can comment on. I think the amount of information you found or, or record and testimony regarding the presence of Mesoamericans in Europe, I don't know if, if um, it has some connection with the historical debate at the time of considering the other, in this case, indigenous population as not human and also that conversation. So I don't know if that had to do with uh, the way it was perceived and described. And before you answer, uh, the comments of the other colleagues made me think of the impressions of, through the eyes of the Mesoamericans, the Nahuas. There is one um, anecdote that they had already decades of having first impressions about the Europeans and their worldviews. And there is a description of how they describe as monkeys the Europeans with their reaction of the encounter of gold. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. And again, there's a uh, wonderful article by James Lockhart called Sightings, which you probably know, which uh, looks at um, uh, how Nawaz uh, interpret European things. So uh, sheep, uh, no, sorry, horses as uh, deer or, uh, or sheep as, uh, as cotton deer, because the wool is cotton-like. Uh, so that is um, also in the back of my mind for thinking about how do we imagine how Rome might have looked through Mesoamerican eyes. The point about um, debates over uh, the status of Native Americans as human or not is actually something that I've spent a lot of time on. Um, basically, um, so the common story is that in 1537, Paul III issued a series of three papal bulls about Native Americans, which uh, said that Native Americans were humans, and then that this allowed them access to um, to the, the sacraments. So it turns out um, that this is mostly a myth invented in the 18th century um, during the, the sort of a second wave of Spanish black legend critiques. There's a, something called the dispute of the new world where enlightenment authors say the Americas are all cold and they're all inferior and everything's small. And in the, in the context of this, this critique, the bulls get published in Latin with a, uh, a title that says, Bulls about how the Pope decreed that Native Americans are human and allowed them access to the sacraments. Actually, if we look at the bulls, um, all the debates about sacraments are about indigenous sacramental ex are all about Dominicans and Franciscans misperforming the sacraments for the Native Americans. So Native American sacramental, sacramental access is not being debated at all. It's, what, it's how the Europeans are actually performing the sacraments. And they're, they're being sloppy. They're performing baptisms too quickly. So it is sacraments, but Native American access is totally, totally uh, assumed. The bit about the humans, uh, humanity is also very key. Because how the, the bull begins is basically saying, some slave merchants, in their lust for gold, have started a rumor saying Native Americans are not really humans. In fact, they're doing this, they're inspired by the devil, and this is totally false. So the bull doesn't present this Native Americans as human debate as like a broad error. It says it's a new strategy by slavers for their own profit. 
Uh, so again, the story is much more fuzzy and complex than what often gets talked about in debate in, in historiography. That said, of course, it was, there was a very long history in Europe of denigrating others, and globally, right, as animals. So uh, peasants are constantly talked about as animals in early modern Europe. There's an amazing play, I think it's 1516, in which a peasant enters, and this is taking place in Europe, right, in, in Spain. A peasant enters, and he's described uh, as an animal in human form. There's an amazing essay by a Spanish scholar, whose name I'm not going to remember right now, but basically about all these bestialization terms for Muslims in 16th and 17th century Spain. So, the idea that the slavers would say, oh, Native Americans animals, they're not being original at all here. They're taking standard tropes from Europe and applying it uh, to a new context. Uh, There's been mention of Solons before, and I'm a huge fan of Solons. Uh, and uh, of course, we know generally that in, in, in situations of cultural contact, often widely taken for granted assumptions get put to challenge in practice. So I think this is a case where even though denigration through bestialization was well established in Europe, in this new context, the Pope finds that, ah, well, no, this is something, this is a standard accusation, but actually in this new context, I need to intervene in this new lie being created by slavers uh, because of the, 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 the context in which this very standard critique gets, uh, is being replayed. So thank you for the question, because it's something, uh, it comes up a lot, actually, talking about this project, and it's something I've been obsessed with. And note that the, 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 the gifts to the Native Americans, or at least to the, um, that are described by Bernal Diaz, like giving gold necklaces is totally a sign of honor and prestige. Like there's a great Titian portrait of Aretino with a famous gold necklace. They also get weapons. And again, in many parts of early modern Europe, peasantry doesn't have access to weapons. So, and again, the clothing they're given is also extremely high status. So at least in how the nobles seem to be treated, um, they're, uh, I mean, the, the, there's nothing in the record that I see that sees them being treated uh, in a lower status, lower than, the, lower than, say, someone from Toledo. It seems to be a, a very interesting treatment of them, or at least, again, the nobles, right? Because there are also these people who are probably slaves. At least that treatment um, is pretty high level, which is, again, not so surprising in terms of class hierarchies often trump other sorts of other forms of difference, right? Um, so I think that answered your questions, yeah? Thanks for the question. Thank you.